My parents, I think that they actually believed very much that they were each other's soulmates. And my mother would say things like, the rocks in his head match the holes in mine. The idea of being happy was so ridiculous to them. It was, that was for modern people or movie stars, i.e. degenerates. That's cartoonist Roz Chast. She's the author of one of the latest Big Read selections, Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant? And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Roz Chast is probably best known for her funny cartoons in The New Yorker about neurotic people coping, or not, with the everyday anxiety that life can produce. In her world, panic is the default setting. Roz is also known for her books. She's written some dozen of them, including her latest, Going Into Town, A Love Letter to New York, which started as a guidebook of the city for her daughter. And most particularly, the memoir, Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant, which won a raft of prizes, including the 2014 National Book Critics Circle Award for Autobiography. Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant has also been chosen for the NEA's Big Read program. It's a bold choice and a bold book. Equal parts laugh-out-loud funny and heartbreaking. Ross Chast is an only child whose parents were in their mid-90s and living in the same rundown Brooklyn apartment they'd been in for 48 years. Then her mother's physical health and her father's mental state began to falter, and they were unable to care for themselves any longer. Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant is a graphic memoir that combines cartoons, found documents, and photographs to chronicle the conflicting emotions and practical challenges of her parents' last years and passing. And she does this with enormous heart and without a trace of sentimentality. We're living a longer life, and more often than not, advanced age brings enormous physical and mental diminishment. And as Roz Chas points out, this is not something we typically talk about. And it's not something most of us know about until we have to. And in fact, it was her own shock at this that compelled her, in part, to write the book. I think, for me, it was a story that I needed to write, partly for myself, to kind of make sense of it a little bit. And that aspect of old age was so new to me, and it was so, in some ways, so horrifying in equal parts. The one part of it that was horrifying was just things related to extreme old age themselves. And the other thing that was horrifying to me was how little I knew about it Mm -hmm. and how little it's talked about in our culture. And yet here I was in the middle of it. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what a health care proxy was. I didn't know, like, I'm going to have to learn my parents' social security numbers and what medications they're on. And, you know, I just Power of attorney. Power of attorney. Didn't know what any of these things were, you know. So it was such an intense experience that I needed to write about it. And there were also very funny things. So there were pages in the book. There's cartoons in the book that I had done not even thinking they were ever going to be in a book that I had just submitted as part of my weekly batch to The New Yorker, you know, like when I went shopping for clothes with my father at one point when my my mother was in the hospital and my father's clothes were in tatters pretty much because they didn't go clothes shopping in Brooklyn. You know, it used to be they didn't go clothes shopping because they were frugal, but then, you know, they were too old and they didn't go. And so they just wore what they had until they were in, in bits and pieces. And I took him clothes shopping and I held up a sweater to him and uh, I said, Dad, do you like the sweater? He said, I can't wear that. And I said, why not? And he said, it's red. Communism. It was so funny, you know, to me. I, I did a cartoon about it, and, but never thinking I would eventually be writing a book and that it would be in the book. Right from the get-go, on the page where we have the table of content, you introduce us to your parents. And I yeah. think in four small cartoons, yeah. one strip, you give us great insight into who they are. Can you describe that? It's it's kind of this silly cartoon. My father is looking at the contents of the book, and he's pointing to it, and he's going, what is all this? And my mother's saying, it's just a contents, George. And he's looking at it still with 
sweat beads like coming <laughs> off of him and anxiety. And she says, stop getting nervous in the service. That was one of her expressions. And uh, he says, well, maybe I'll make some tea. And she says, use the tea bag on the counter. It still has plenty of juice in it. And they use tea bags like over, not twice, but like three, four times. They would just keep the tea bag on a little saucer and use it over and over and over. And my mother would make an announcement to say, I like tincture of tea. You know, she would just like practically just wave the tea bag <laughs> over the water. In the general direction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they came up in the Depression. Yes, exactly, exactly. And they grew up poor. So, you know, these habits of frugality were... Ingrained. Yeah. Your parents were older when you were born. They could have almost been your grandparents. Yeah. So they weren't one generation removed. They were two generations removed. Absolutely. You know, my parents were older than that generation of, um, especially with Jews, you know, who moved to the suburbs, who belonged to country clubs, the kind of Philip Roth was satirizing, yeah. you know, that generation of Jews. My parents were older than that. Um, they were cl almost closer to, like, the immigrant gem generation. And so it was quite different. Yeah. And I think you, you really tackle that in the cartoon where your parents refer to each other as soulmates. Yes. Yeah. Can you just talk about that? Because it, it really twigged something for me. And yeah. I mean, in some ways, they're like pre-psychotherapy, you know, like where uh, my parents, I think that they actually believed very much that they were each other's soulmates. And my mother would say things like, the rocks in his head match the holes in mine. And, you know, they were both very neurotic in a lot of ways and fearful, but they really believed in true love in this way that wasn't just like, well, we believe in this adult kind of love and we are whole people in ourselves. And da -da -da -da. No, they were like old school. It was like, we are soulmates. We don't have to be better people than we are. You know, you accept me for who I am. I accept you for who you are, even though we fight and stuff like that. We're not trying to live up to some, you know, somebody wrote in a book what kind of person, you know, you're supposed to be to be a healthy, quote unquote, quote, adult. You know, they just didn't care about any of that. So, And you also say, I think, in the bottom, where, where there's this business about happy. What are you talking about? Yeah, happy. Happy, happy right. They didn't, the idea of being happy was so ridiculous to them. It was, I mean, here I say, it's not as if they never fought because they did. And my mother's saying, don't sit sideways. You're twisting your kishkas. But the concept of looking for something better or being happy, that was for modern people or movie stars, i.e. degenerates. They were a tight little unit. Codependent? Of course we're codependent. Thank God. And, you know, maybe they believed if they just held on to each other really tightly for eternity, nothing would ever change. And I really think that that's what they thought. Yeah. You but, know? you know, it's so interesting in thinking about this concept of being happy as a modern concept. Because it, I, it, yeah. it is. It is. It really is. And for many people, even now as we speak, yeah. for so many people, they, they just need to survive. Happy? Are you kidding me? Do I, I have food? I know. I know. I know. Well, that was my parents. And and I think that that's more of an attitude of the of the past. It's this, this thing about happiness. I mean... Well, we have time to worry about it. Yeah, we have time to worry <laughs> about it. And also, like, keeping that going... It sells products. It sells books. It keeps, like, the machinery of searching for happiness kind of, it keeps it going, yeah. you know. Your parents were very different people. Yes. Oh, very much so. Your mother was an assistant principal. Yes. Which right away can put the fear of God into somebody. Yeah. Yeah. She was the disciplinarian. And always right. Always right. And that could be tough sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she did not like any kind of argument. And she was often right, but, you know, she's very sure of herself. And she was also full of rage. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which was intimidating to you and your father. Yeah. Yeah, she was a very intense person. And your father, he was? He was a very sweet person. And I think he didn't like conflict and less sure of himself. I got such a strong sense that he just loved your mother. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, and relied on, I, I know relied on, but just thought 
She was always right. I mean, yeah, I, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't feel like he was the one who needed convincing about this. Right, right, right. No, they really were melded together in this way, and uh, he did believe in her, you know. And I think that when he died, because he died before her, and I think that she missed having that always like somebody who believed in you totally. Mm-hmm. That's so rare. Yeah, it's so rare. There's a cartoon in the book uh, that centers around a piece of pastry that I think sums this up. Could you describe that cartoon, which actually is one of my favorites? Should I read it? Yeah, Is please. Right? Okay. It takes place at the assisted living where they eventually were. And in my book, I call it The Place. And I brought a uh, cheese danish. So my father's on the couch. I'm bringing in a cheese danish. Look, Dad, I brought you a cheese danish. Oh, my favorite. Honey. And he turns to my mother, who's sitting on the other side of the couch, which now you see. And he goes, honey, care to share this with me? No. Because I ate my lunch, unlike some people who were so busy socializing that they neglected their lunch, which is why some people are hungry now. And my father says, I'll cut it into quarters. That way, if you change your mind, you can have some. As I told you, I'm still full from lunch. I'll cut it in half. Then I'll eat one half, and I'll put the other half away for later. And then my mother says to me, watch, he'll forget and eat both halves. And, you know, she's in the background. My father's in the foreground. He has the knife, and he is, like, surrounded by these musical notes, like, la, 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 la. And she finishes it up by saying, and then some people won't be hungry for dinner. And I say to my mother, I don't get why you're the boss of Dad's Danish ingestion. And he says, actually, your mother's right. She's a brilliant woman. Thank you, Elizabeth. (laughs) You know, I really should just shut up and, like, let them work it out because they had a little dance going that, you know, my little helpful comments were not that helpful. I mean, I remember I this was not an incident in the book, but it was going with them. This was they used to go to this place um, up at Sylvan Lake and they went there every summer. And one time I went with them and there was like a little kind of place where you could buy ice cream there. And my mother gets a cone, and I don't remember what what flavor she got, and I got a cone. And my father is looking at the flavors that they have that day, and he goes, rainbow sprinkle, maybe I'll try that. And my mother says, George, you don't want that. And she starts telling him, like, what flavor he can or can't have, and he sort of backs down from it, and he gets, like, vanilla or something. And I remember I was so angry, I threw away my ice cream. And I was an adult. That's, like, totally childish. That's, like, baby behavior. But sometimes when I was with them, I felt so regressed. I felt like it's this is the same crap that I grew up with, and I'm still made as angry about it as I was when I was a kid. But now, like, probably if I had thrown away my ice cream in anger, like, then I would have gotten, you know, socked or whatever. But um, as an adult now, I can just do it, and she's not going to sock me. So but so it's just ridiculous. Yeah, they made me crazy. Yeah. And that does not cease when they get older. No, it doesn't. It doesn't cease. You think it would, but it doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. yeah. And that's part of what this book explores about aging and coming to grips with yeah. death and not wanting to talk about any of it. Yeah. Yeah. And you document that, but who would have thunk that doing it in cartoons would sort of be the perfect vehicle for a very tough subject. Yeah, well, for me, this is what I do. So it was better for me to do it this way than any other way. You laugh, you cry, because as you and your parents are moving through this, I so recognized it. I I just could recognize it. So I think there's something always so miraculous about something that is so specific, but at the same time can just speak to so many people. I mean, that's art. Oh, well, well, thanks. But I also think, in a way, your mother sets us up for it when, in the beginning of the book, she's like, I don't want to talk about death. This is navel-gazing. Yeah, yeah. And I think by presenting it as a memoir in cartoons, it mitigates against a kind of self-involved navel-gazing where you could lose somebody. Yeah. Or it's just yeah. like, yeah, well, things are tough all over. Sorry, Ross. Yeah, things are tough. I heard that growing up. <laughs> things are tough all over. Oh, yeah, me too. Right, right, right. I know. The God, I hadn't heard that expression as well. <laughs> things are tough all over. And I, I do think that that's what cartooning this 
did. Some of the issues that you had to deal with, and probably one of the most awful is the whole money thing. Oh, God. Yeah. It's enraging. It's terrible because you feel like such a expletive even thinking about it, and especially because it's their money that they saved up for. But there's an aspect of it. It's almost comical in a black humor way. Like, I think about the way my parents, like, scrimped and saved and the way when we moved out of the city and my father would ask me questions like, so how much are they charging fig for Fig Newtons in your area? And I would be like, I don't know, you know? Like, are they three forty nine or are they, like, two ninety nine? I'm not sure, you know? But they were very conscious of, like, How much whether, is a quart of milk? <laughs> yeah, how much is a quart of milk? They were very conscious whether the Fig Newtons were two seventy nine or two ninety nine. Yeah. you know? And you would go to the store where they were two seventy nine. So my parents, who were scrimpers their entire lives... To be now at this assisted living place where, and it was a very nice place. I've heard of places where it's nuts. You have to pay $400,000 to even enter. And if your parent dies, like within the first few months, they keep all the money. I mean, it is disgusting. It is just some sort of like robbery. And the costs at the end It was Niagara Falls, you know, just all of it just flowing. Every penny just went to their care. And they weren't even like an intensive care in the hospital. By the time at the end with my mother, the last two years, especially the last year, she was 97. She was barely out of bed. She was in this assisted living place, which was over $7,000 a month just for the rent. And then there were like additional charges for this and that. and Oh, and their insurance, by the way, which they had been paying into their whole lives, did not cross state lines. So then they were just, you know, Medicare. They didn't have their the health insurance plan, the teacher's plan that they were a part of. So that, that didn't work. And then with assisted living, something that I was to learn was that they have plans of care. They have like assisted living, the very basic I think they give, actually, they give you like six hours a week of help, like if you need a shower, six hours. Then there's another tier, you know, where maybe you need like 12 hours a week. Then there's another tier, and then you top out, and then you have the choice. Do you transfer your elderly parent to a nursing home, or do you hire additional care, which is not covered by anything? So I hired additional care, and at that point, the costs were like fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars a month. I mean, it was just unreal. And you know, I mean, part of me was like, you know, thank God they have the money. Most of me was really, you know, I'm glad. But I was also panicked because I started to think, what happens when the money runs out? And at that point, I'm going to have to go into our money, and I have two kids in college. So how's that going to work? You know, do we put a second mortgage on the house? I don't know. I don't know. And it was really scary. Uh, But you're not supposed to talk about it. No, definitely not. And I just think it's better if we sort of know what we're getting into here. Another thing you had to deal with was their apartment. Oh, my God. Yeah, well, they never threw anything away, you know, because they were children of the Depression. And one immediate effect of that on me was being less interested in collections and stuff or anything. I mean, I used to like to go to secondhand stores. And now I look at it and it's like, this is like somebody's dead parent stuff. And it's like, if I didn't want my dead parent stuff, why do I want your dead parent stuff? You know, I don't want anybody's dead parent stuff. I really am not even like a big fan of stuff the way I used to be. I mean, I like some stuff. I like stuff. I like pretty shiny stuff. But it's different now. Yeah. And you made the decision to include photographs throughout this book. And, yeah. and, and some of them of your parents, your parents and you, your parents and yeah. you as you were growing up. But some of them was the stuff. The stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, we all know photos can be manipulated. Yeah. But there's something to me about, like, looking at the photographs where it's like, no, I did not make up cheese tainer, you know, that's patched with masking tape. I didn't make up old milk carton full of pencils. When I was going through their stuff, there was like drawers of newspapers. I mean, it was so sad. It's like, why did you save all this stuff? I don't know. Yeah. And and you did. You walked away from it. I walked away from it, yeah. I pulled out a few things I wanted, and the rest of it, I just walked away from it. You're good 
at showing how we cling to things, yeah. you know, from ideas to stuff and to life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I might be in the same boat. That's the thing. You don't really know until you get there. But it's it was definitely something that I did not know about. And I think that's why I was so compelled to write to write it down. And also it was a way of remembering my parents. And I don't have like that great of a memory. So I, I wanted to be able to hear their voices. It was a way of holding on to that for a little long as talk about clinging. How did you even know cartooning was a possibility as a career? Um, I didn't and I don't. Uh, <laughs> I still don't. Um, it feels very, well, to use a word that I just heard that Linda Barry used, the wonderful Linda Barry, that she used to describe cartooning as a career. She says it's very rickety. And I think that's an excellent, perfect description. Even when things are going well, it's rickety. I think for me, it was just, I loved to draw from the time I was a little kid. And, you know, I liked to tell stories, and I liked things that made me laugh. I liked cartoons, and it was just a kind of natural thing. I didn't really analyze it that much. I didn't think of it in terms of career. I like, just, this is what I want to do when I grow up. Well, I, I did, but I didn't. It was uh-huh. like, this is what I do. Like, I draw, and I my, my drawings are sort of starting to be like cartoons, and I'm just going to keep doing that, and like... Now I ha- I'm out of college and I have to earn money and I can't do anything else, so I guess this is what I'm going to try to do. Did your parents read your cartoons in The New Yorker? They did. They, I think that my sense of humor was really different from theirs, but they were very, very proud. They were New Yorker subscribers, and so that they knew that that was like a good thing. You know, my mother, I remember her once saying something like, I see what you did here. You made the panel, the third one's a kicker. And it was like, oh, okay. So I don't think that, like, there was really much enjoyment that of the cartoons. I think they enjoyed that uh, I got published in the magazine. Or sometimes she would say, you drew me and daddy. And, of course, I would say, like, no, no, no. These are kind of, like, archetypes and amusing, uh, which is like a little bit of the truth and a little bit of avoiding that, you know, you use what you know. I'm not going to draw Charles Saxon's parents. I don't know them. You know, if I'm drawing a mother, it's going to be loosely based on the mothers that I know, you know, including you. You have a cartoon of your mother's sex talk with you, which I think is a classic and I really would like you to read that for us. That was, oh, real. That was completely, I, I completely oh, yeah, believe yeah, that it was yeah, real. I, yeah. I doubt none of it described and that cartoon. My mother decided that she was going to tell me, like, one of her many theories. And this was a theory about women and sexual feelings or attraction or something. And she said you could tell the level of a woman's, like, sexiness by, like, the height of her heels. And she started telling me about some lady that she knew who was, like, in her late 80s who was in some assisted living place, and she wore, like, the highest heels possible, and all the men were, like, always after her. And then she would look at her, she said, look, look at mine, they're pure beetle crushers, you know? And I was like, Mom, that's ridiculous. And, blah, blah, blah. and then I look at my shoes, and they're, like, clogs, you know? And it's like, oh, God, I'm pathetic. <laughs> I, I completely believed that as I yeah. was looking at my sneakers. Yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. That woman is right. She is right. Got to get a grip, Joe. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. And yet, you know, walking around New York, I'm always happy I'm not wearing, like, some like, oh, ridiculous can't. shoes. It's so stupid. You'll break your neck. I know. You'll break your neck, and they hurt, and I'll be cranky, and then I won't be able to pay attention to anything else. I'll just be thinking, my feet hurt. <laughs> my feet hurt, you know. And this is a great segue into the book Going Into Town, which began as an advice book for your daughter. Yes. I really do want to talk about it. This is the new book Going Into Town, A Love Letter to New York. And my husband and I lived on the Upper West Side in Manhattan for almost 10 years. Shortly before my son was born, we moved to Park Slope in Brooklyn. And then shortly before my daughter was born, we moved to a suburb about an hour north of the city. And it was very intense. I mean, it was the first time I had not lived in an apartment. I did not know how to drive. I had a new baby. It was really disorienting. But, you know, I did learn how to drive. And when my daughter was around 18, 
she decided that she wanted to go to college in Manhattan. And we had taken many trips into Manhattan, but as everybody knows, it's very different when you're a passenger than when you're the driver. Like when you're a driver, you know you have to know how to get from A to B. If you're the passenger, you might not know anything. You might just kind of be sitting there and watching the trees and everything like that. And that's the way it was for my daughter. In spite of all the trips we had made into the city, she really didn't know. So before she left she uh, for School of Visual Arts, I decided I would you know talk to her and just see like how much she understood of of getting around Manhattan. And I said, you know, it's actually not hard because most of it's laid out on a grid. And she said, what do you mean? So I got a piece of paper and I explained that you know avenues run north south, the streets run east west and the avenues are farther apart than the streets. It looks something vaguely like this. Of course, you know, below, you know, 14th mm-hmm. Street on the west side, it gets really dicey. Don't think about that. But most of it is like on a grid. So she understood that. And I said, well, okay, so if you are on 52nd Street and you need to get to 55th Street, you walk uptown three blocks. And she said to me, what's a block? And, you know, my head basically spins around on its neck, you know, like Linda Blair with The Exorcist. It just does the whole 360. And I realized we need to talk. Okay. Was that the moment you realized, oh, my God, I've raised a suburban child? Yes, 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 yes. I've raised a suburban child who does not have any kind of understanding of blocks. And I should have known this because earlier, I remember once we were in the city and she looked at the fire escapes and she literally asked me, Mom, what are those West Side Story things? Because she was familiar with the graphic of the cover of the album and on posters and every place, you know, when you see a reference to West Side Story, it's so famous. There they are, exactly. There they are. She knew, she recognized it as a thing, but she didn't know what it was, whether maybe it was just a, a design, you know? And that cracked me up. I remember like, oh my God, she doesn't know what a fire escape is. That's so funny. Anyway, I made her a booklet that she could take with her. And it was about like 12 pages. And it just had things like a little map of Manhattan explaining the avenues and the streets, explaining that Fifth Avenue divided the east side from the west side, explaining about these are the west side trains, these are the east side trains, you know, the numbers. And then there's letter trains and those kind of sometimes jig-jag between the east and the west side. What a cross street is and why you should know what a cross street is. These are like main streets. They're like main cross streets. Uh, You know, how to hail a taxi, Uh, what the lights on the top of the taxi mean. Like, you know, if it's lit up, it's empty. If it's not lit up, there's somebody in the cab. You know, just stuff that guidebooks don't tell you, Mm -hmm. you know, and I just and the reason I chose those facts was because I love New York so much. And I thought, uh, as I said in the book, if she had just some good basic information, she might have a sort of foundation on which to build her own, you know, information on top of. But if you don't even have a foundation, then nothing really adheres One great piece of advice you gave her in that book was how to walk on a city street. Yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, it... I used to say that. I used to say they just should have a lesson. This is how you walk in the city when yeah. before they let people into Manhattan. Right. I know. It's like, please don't. Please don't dawdle. Please don't dawdle. Don't, just don't block. Keep it going. Don't block the sidewalk, <laughs> and, you know? Yeah. And, and don't stop and look at your cell phone, please. Right. In the in middle of the sidewalk. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. It's like, you know, thank you. Thank you. Or like at the top of an escalator. Yeah. Are you kidding? And, you know, just basic, basic sort of things. And at the end of four years, she gave it back to me, and she said it had been really helpful. And I, I had, like, the addresses of the major museums and, um, you know, why museum? You know, she might want to go there, and it's kind of fun. And the Metropolitan Museum is it's it's pay what you want, and so it's and it's incredible. And that's a museum I grew up with. Oh, oh it is best. fabulous. And you're right. You can never see it all. You can never see ever, it all. Ever, ever, ever. Ever, ever, ever. It is truly like a glimpse into the infinite. You know, some people get really thrilled by going to the Grand Canyon and they feel that sense of awe. And I've never been to the Grand Canyon, and I do want to go there sometime. But I have awe being in the city. It just makes me very happy. I just love seeing it. But part of the advice you give your daughter is just to be open to walking. Yes, yes, yes. Walking, walking, walking. It's the best walking city. Yes. It is a fantastic walking city. And I am very biased because I don't like to drive. 
I really dislike it. And I love that everything is right next to everything else. I mean, I think that's another thing that I've learned from doing some traveling around the country, that New York is the uniquest of unique. Um, it is super unique because it's an island and it's small. And so everything is really condensed. In Manhattan, you can walk from the Hudson River over to the East River and you will see everything smashed up against each other, all these different architectural styles. You'll see like some building that has $10 million condos. Mm. And then it's next to some like crappy little building with like, you know, this like grimy little deli on the floor. And it's still like that. I mean, people say, yes, the city's changing. I know it is. I know it's changing. And yes, it's more expensive and so forth. But I talk about it in, in this book, the density of visual information that one impression after another, one thing after another, and there's always people on the street. Always, 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 there's tons of people on the street. And I, I really like that a lot. You know, E.B. White, he wrote a wonderful book about New York called uh, Here's New York. Yeah. And he, he writes about the gift of loneliness in the city and that I feel like walking around in the city, there's a kind of anonymity because everybody is very intent on their own thing. And you're there because a lot of times because you're working or you know, you're not just kind of aimlessly, or there are people who are aimless, aimlessly drifting around, but... Um, they're not that interested in you. No, they're not that interested. Nobody's that interested in you. There's the gift of loneliness. I, I use that phrase, but he uses it in a sort of positive yeah. way. And I like that a lot, even though there's tons and tons of people around it. When did you start bringing color into your work? Because um, I love the way you use water. It's watercolor, yeah, it's I'm water assuming. Color, right, right, yeah, right. I love the way you use Thank it in you. your work. It's Thanks. really striking. Thank you. I love, love, love using color and have loved that since I was a child. And watercolor, I mean, I had done a couple of covers for The New Yorker, but I think it might have been under Tina Brown who suggested that I do a cartoon in color. And that's when I started doing more watercolor work. And I really love watercolors a lot. I love, oh boy, I'm trying to think of like how to verbalize it. I don't know how to verbalize it. Sorry. No, that's fine. Yeah. I think talking about. Yeah, it's it's, it's there's hard. not really because uh, I can't tell you why I like the, I like it so much. There's a delicacy, but a depth at the same time. Well, I think that's the thing about watercolors for me that they are in some ways delicate you know, compared to like oil paint or acrylic or something like that, or gouache. But I think you can really get a lot of depth of color at the same time with it, depending on like how you build up the tones. And over the years, I've learned my own methods of sort of fixing little mistakes, you know, which you can't correct that much. I mean, when I first started it, I thought this is the most unforgiving medium there is. But I've learned now that there are these little tweaks you can do to fix to make a green a little more blue rather than yellow or whatever, you know. Your drawing of Grand Central was gorgeous. Oh, thank it you. It was beautiful. You captured the blue of that ceiling perfectly. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah, it's Grand Central is a magic place. Mm. It's so beautiful. And I've always been happy that when I've come into the city, it's to Grand Central and not Penn Station, which is the armpit. armpit. It's an armpit. It is an armpit. That's the only way to describe it. Yeah. How did that get built? I don't know. In Going Into Town, you also sing the praises of public parks. Absolutely. I mean, if you live in the city, then you have, you know, Central Park. You have lots of greenery. There's a kind of communal thing about living in the city where we all get to sort of share Central Park. You know, it's everybody's. You don't own like a little piece of it that you have to, have to like, maintain. you know, maintain. It's everybody's place. And I don't know. I think that's a really Men, for me, a mentally healthy kind of thing. Like, we're all in this together. Let's, like, take care of it. Let's not, like, crap it up. Yeah. Roz Chess, thank you so much. I, it was really just such a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, pleasure to talk to you, too. Fellow New Yorker. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. That was cartoonist Roz Chast. Her latest book is Going Into Town, A Love Letter to New York. And her prize-winning memoir, Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant?, is a recent selection for the NEA's Big Read program. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. And the Artworks podcast is now available on iTunes. 
please subscribe. And if you like us, leave us a rating. It will help people to find us. For the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening.